Hey folks, before we get any farther, I need to make an announcement. I sadly do make mistakes sometimes. Okay, probably more than sometimes. And the support I get here in correcting the errors has been great. I originally wrote that it was William Sherman that was the Union commander, but I was misspoken. It was actually Thomas Sherman, and I am ever so grateful to Carl Gillette for correcting me. Please, if you find error in my videos, let me know and I'll do my best to fix them. Also, thank you for being a wonderful community. Welcome to Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition. Today we're going to talk about the Battle of Fort Pulaski, located in Chatham County, Georgia, on April 10th and 11th, 1862. The Union had wanted to take Fort Pulaski since the beginning of the war. However, the location of the fort meant the Union needed other key battles and constructions to happen to give them this opportunity. The fort had been carefully built for the last 50 years, using the latest engineering technology at the time. General Thomas Sherman was fully supportive of the siege of Fort Pulaski and put a plan together using artillery. He ordered heavy artillery reinforcements and by February 21st, the heavy artillery began to arrive. Using Chief Engineering Officer Quincy Adam Gilmore's experience and advice, the artillery batteries were set up on the northwestern tip of Tybee Island, just within range of Fort Pulaski. The Confederates believed artillery at the range of more than 1,000 yards had no chance of breaking through the thick walls of Fort Pulaski and therefore did not address the growing threat on Tybee Island. To avoid being fully detected, Gilmore's men worked on moving the canyons the last mile at night and in silence. By March, they had 11 siege batteries, each battery mounting 36 pieces of artillery. Unbeknownst to the Confederates, many of these cannons were rifled. Unlike the smoothbore weapons, which were less accurate and less powerful, a rifled barrel would cause a shell to spin as it emerges the barrel, making it more accurate, increasing its range, and improving its penetration capability. In turn, Fort Pulaski was commanded by Confederate Colonel Charles H. Olmsted and contained 385 Confederate soldiers, 48 guns that could focus 20 of those guns at any one point at Gilmore's forces. Colonel Olmsted was offered a chance to surrender. However, Olmsted believed with the advances of the fort and the capability of his own artillery that he would instead defend the fort and refuse the offer. On April 10, 1862, a single 13-inch mortar fired its 218-pound shell over the walls of Fort Pulaski. This heralded a barrage of artillery fire concentrating on the southeast corner of the fort. Adjusting their fire as they first targeted the parapet and then the walls, they removed the brickwork like a pickaxe. They used the rifled cannons to shoot first to dig into the walls and then the larger columbiads to destroy the mason work beneath the bricks. The Confederates returned fire but slowly their fire lessened as the loss of their cannons mounted. This continued for most of the day. The following morning, on April 11th, Gilmore commenced firing again, wiping out the Confederate guns that had been repaired the night before quickly and breaching the wall. By noon, the Union fire was getting past the wall and finding targets inside the fort, including the Northwest Powder Magazine, which housed 40,000 pounds of gunpowder. Colonel Olmsted realized the danger his people were in and surrendered immediately. The resulting casualties was a single death and several people wounded on the Union side and up to 20 dead and a surrender of 364 on the Confederate side. That's it for this week. Please join us again next week for Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition.